as we know from research, hogs can get into an area and it's almost impossible to eradicate them. Wild pig numbers have been increasing across the United States and North America for pretty much the last 20 to 40 years. One in every four acorns that falls on the ground and is ready for an animal to eat, a wild pig will come consume it. In this week's episode of Deer and Deer Hunting, we're gonna switch it up a little bit and we're gonna talk about hogs and hog hunting. What does that have to do with whitetails? A lot more than you think. Stay tuned. So if we're going to talk about feral hog populations in America, we have to go to the experts. And for us, that means going to the Auburn University Deer Lab, where they're doing a five-year study on the feral hog's impact on white-tailed deer. Led by Dr. Stephen Ditchkoff and his grad students, they're coming up with some fascinating findings. I'm Dr. Steve Ditchkoff. I'm professor of wildlife ecology at Auburn University in the School of Forestry and Wildlife Sciences. Um, I'm involved with uh, research with large mammals and specifically focus my research on white-tailed deer and wild pigs. Wild pigs have a lot of negative impacts on, on the landscape. Uh, they have negative impacts and primarily because of their propensity to root for forage underneath the soil surface. Um, going after insects and grubs or whether it be roots and tubers. Um, they move a lot of soil, um, cause a lot of damage to the landscape. This leads to erosion, sedimentation in streams, that sort of thing. Um, their rooting tends to you know, create niches for invasive exotic plants. Um, they also have a lot of in negative impacts on wildlife species, um, ground nesting birds, quail, turkeys, that sort of thing. We know they cause problems. Um, sea turtle nests, um, they are extremely destructive to sea turtle nests. Um, we have found, found wild pigs actually eating white-tailed deer fawns alive. Um, we know that there's a lot of impacts. Um, we're just really scratching the surface and understanding how detrimental they are to wildlife and plant species here in North America. At Auburn University, the students are the ones leading the way by developing techniques and observation methods to collect the data they need to complete their studies. With the support and guidance of our instructors, Ariel Fay is an undergraduate who has taken on the challenge of better understanding the amount of food resources that wild hogs consume over their competition. My research is looking at the impacts of wild pigs on the environment and specifically how their consumption rates may be impacting negatively other wildlife species, particularly white-tailed deer. To collect our data, we have established 40 different um, camera monitoring sites on our study area. And at each of these sites, we have placed five acorns that are monitored by a game camera. And we monitor each of these acorns to see what species come to consume them. And from our research, we can see how many pigs are coming, how many acorns pigs are eating compared to other wildlife species such as turkeys, deer, raccoons, squirrels, stuff like that. Um, so we had year one of data collection in which we monitored everything with pigs on the landscape. And then through last summer, we came and have, are still continuing to trap and remove pigs from the landscape. So we can see before when pigs are here and after when pigs are no longer here, if species consumption rates are shifting from maybe less uh, wild pigs to more deer or other native wildlife species. This tree, this tree is a big oak tree that we came out in August and saw that it was producing acorns. So presumably wildlife would be using it. We set up this sand pad in the acorns and we put little loops around it because 
Again, it helps us see the acorns on the cameras. And as long as the batteries will go, around two weeks, 13 days to 14 days. We also have some buckets here. These are our acorn traps that we use to <clears throat> monitor when acorns are falling. This one in our first year of data collection, we found that out of all the acorns that were consumed, wild pigs consumed about 25%. So one in every four acorns that falls on the ground and is ready for an animal to eat, a wild pig will come consume it. Deer only have three to choose from now. Hunting actually can hurt the effects of trying to get rid of hog populations, and here's why. Land of Whitetail is brought to you by Million Dollar Buck Bash, powered by Apex Competitions. Hunt, compete, win. Outdoor Edges game processing sets to do it yourself and save. Redneck Blinds, the best hunting blinds on the planet. Cutty Back, Cutty Link, 24 cameras, one cell plan, $10 a month. And by Hunt Stand, the number one hunting app in the country. For hunting, shooting, camping, fishing gear, and more, go to sportsmansguide.com. They sell all the top brands in the industry at unbeatable prices. For everything you need to outfit your passion for a lot less, go to sportsmansguide.com. Learning how wild hogs impact other wildlife species is important. Learning how to effectively eradicate wild hogs from an area? Now that's something most landowners can take straight to the bank. So from a hunting perspective, you think, oh, hunting is good. You know, hunting will help reduce hog populations. Not really. Hunting actually can hurt the effects of trying to get rid of hog populations, and here's why. It's the same thing with a trapping effort going bad. Wild hogs are extremely smart animals. In, in the trapping instance, Let's say they're going in and they're trapping 50 or 60% of those hogs. Those hogs that don't get in the traps, they're live traps that come down like big box traps. The hogs that aren't trapped become so incredibly smart that they become trap resistance, they call it. Hunting, same thing. If you're just going out and hunting hogs, thinking that you're gonna to try to control those populations, hogs are smarter than deer when it comes to surviving. They're gonna learn how to survive and the ones that do learn how to survive are gonna be so smart you're not going to be able to hunt them and kill them. It's, it, their noses are unbelievable. Um, here at Auburn, you know, a couple of years ago, had some former students develop a, a trapping strategy called whole sounder removal. Whole sounder removal is a five-step process that we've shown to be effective for eliminating wild pigs. In one study, we, we effectively eliminated wild pigs on 20,000 acres. The five steps in that process are to, number one, go out and survey the population. What we do is we go out and we establish bait piles about every 400 acres. We establish those bait piles on sites that have sign of wild pig. We'll put a camera on that site and so we'll survey that 5, 10, 20,000 acres with bait piles to figure out where we have wild pigs and where we don't. And we will identify individual sounders. The sounder is the social group in wild pigs of related females and their young. They move around together as a group and so we identify those social groups. Once we have those social groups identified, then we identify the individuals in that group. You know, group A may, might have seven, seven adult females and four offspring, and the next group is going to have a different composition. So now we know where we're trapping and what we're targeting. The third step is to build a trap at those sites, um, and at, but the most important part of building the trap is to acclimate those pigs to the trap. Wild pigs are extremely intelligent, and we don't want to catch half the sounder and educate the other half. And so what we do is we'll build that trap, we will tie it open, we will monitor that trap at the camera, and we will not even think about setting a trigger until all of those pigs are actively going in the trap. That way, when we, when we target a sounder, we catch them all, not just 10%, 50%, 75% of the sounder. We do not want to educate any pigs. So the, our fourth step in that is to actually trap the pigs, and the fifth is to monitor afterwards. Was there a female from that group that was out farrowing or giving birth? Is there another group that moves into the area? So we do want to have some bait piles with cameras maintained after we've eliminated pigs to make sure that we don't have any individuals that are moving around. So 
Um, tell me what your name is. Spell it for me. My name's Stectives are to look at how pig populations influence deer and turkey populations. We're also looking. So last night we used the the camera trap to drop the door on on five pigs, and they're all fairly sizable pigs from what we can tell. It looked like one of them might have been nursing in the past, and uh, so it'd be a good a good one to remove from the population. So the heart blood is what we do first. It's the most time sensitive of all of the, the samples because if the blood coagu coagulates, it can be really difficult to draw, draw blood. So we start with that. We then move on to the, probably one of the more time consuming tests, which is the fungal swabs around the snouts. The process of taking it doesn't take too much time, but the sanitation of changing gloves after every swab really adds up. After that, we have to pull the kidneys and spleens from each of these pigs and we'll put them in the bags to go with the heart blood. For our purposes on this project, we're mainly interested in the removal of the pigs. The data collection is, um, we don't have much data collection beyond age and sex for each of these pigs. It's all uh, trying to help other folks out in the university and, and you know, they go out of their way to help us with supplies and all that stuff. So it's, it's kind of a scratch each other's back situation where we can hopefully get, get a lot of good research out for the university. When you're hunting hogs, if you're hunting them with a bow and arrow or a crossbow, you have to learn hog anatomy, it's different than a deer. It's safe to say that Dan Schmidt, the editor-in-chief of Deer and Deer Hunting Magazine, probably counts white-tailed deer in his sleep. So when he gets invited down to South Carolina for an early season hunt with Blackwater Hunting Services, his dreams start to fill with images of velvet-covered brow tines and split G2s. Instead, he quickly finds himself surrounded by a plethora of wild South Carolina hawks. Don't worry. They'll shoot those too. Hunting hogs, don't get me wrong, is a lot of fun. Especially with a bow and arrow. I'm not there with a bow and arrow this time. I'm not messing around. I'm going with my rifle. It's a Model 7. I got precision hunter ammo. I'm loaded for bear, so to speak, or loaded for hogs. But when you're hunting hogs, if you're hunting them with a bow and arrow, or a crossbow, you have to learn hog anatomy. It's different than a deer. Those vitals are farther forward. It's, it's a tough critter to kill because those vitals are kind of hidden by what they call a shield. It's basically an extended scapula, a big piece of cartilage that extends past the scapula and almost covers the heart depending upon how that, that hog's leg is when you shoot him. With a rifle, there's no messing around. You're not going for the lungs or the heart. You're trying to kill him on the spot because that's what you want to do. And a high shoulder shot works, neck shot works, head shots work. I try not to do head shots because I want to be, you know, that high shoulder shot, just like a deer, it's going to drop them like that. Well, let me show you what happened here. <laughs> So that's the nice thing about early season hunting for hogs. You shoot one, they're not quite educated yet. 
you just sit a little bit, they're gonna come back. Two hogs down, a lot of good meat on the ground right there. Unfortunately, it became dark too quick because we sure would have liked to have been there for another half an hour of daylight, maybe get one or two more. But that is an exciting hunt. It's an exciting way to spend, you know, an August weekend. Well, that's the first one. First one. Tell you what, that is an exciting afternoon to end the hunt. Two nice hogs, some great meat, and some great memories from South Carolina. Blackwater Hunting Services, just a really classic hunting camp in the heart of the South with a lot of opportunities. Land of Whitetail is brought to you by Easton. Get armed and deadly with Easton FMJ arrows. Scent Killer Gold with Hunt Dry Technology Plus. Apply it, dry it, and go hunt. 10 Point Crossbow Technologies. There is no substitute. Sever Broadheads. Straight through it. And by Exodus Broadheads by Quality Archery Designs. American made tough. If you can break it, we'll replace it. Hunt Stand, the number one hunting app in the country. Revolutionary mapping abilities, weather info, National Property Ownership Database, Ultra High Resolution Map Printing Services, and much more. Download it free today from the Apple App Store or Google Play. Hunt Stand. Upgrade your arsenal. All right, Dan, I know that this cellular technology has come a long ways just in the past year, and I know that Cuddyback came out with that cutting link system four years ago. So today, I have to get with the times yep. and see exactly how this can benefit us in managing these properties. So this is what we're talking about, Dan, the future of, you know, and we, you know, we discussed this about cell camera technology, and I know it's come a, a long ways. Tell me, you know, what do we have going on with Cuddy back? But I know it's not only just the cell system, you've got the solar system involved with it as well. Yep, so, you know, four years ago, Cuddy back brought out the Cuddy Link technology, which allowed multiple cameras to talk to each other and the user could go pull a single card, obviously cutting down on how often they're intruding on the property and that was a big advantage. So in today's environment, everybody's interested in the cellular technology. And we came out with cellular about two years ago, a little more than that, uh, but it's continued to progress, right? And so now the advantage is that I can have the single cellular unit linked up to all these cameras on the property. And now today we can have up to 24 cameras total on the network. It was 16 previously, right? It was 16 yep. previously. So those other 23 cameras can send back to this unit. And then this unit's gonna send me all the pictures to my phone whether I want to look at them via email, whether I want to look at them via online or a text message. And we actually have an app coming here shortly. Um, so I've got the ability to get all the pictures to my phone, getting that data in a very timely manner. Not only have we done things to ex extend that, but with the solar technology, because we're in an open food plot here, I can have this running off of solar so I don't even have to mess with the batteries. Which so literally- really is a big benefit. No doubt. I've got uh, one of my cameras that's been out for 767 days and I've not had to touch it. That's, that's really the goal that we want, right? We want to be able to put these cameras out, get the intel for the user, have the pictures come to you remotely and not mess with the system. That's the goal. Let your trail camera be your extra eyes when you can't be at that other stand. Now, you might have your trail camera set up on a food plot or a field edge, really watching those big deer movement areas. But once hunting season starts, 
adjust and move these to your hunting spots that you're not at at that particular time. That way if that hot spot that you're sitting on suddenly goes dead, you can check your trail cameras and see if those other spots suddenly are lit up or turned on. Now with the Cuddy Back, Cuddy Link system, it will daisy chain together without cellular service up to 15 units as long as you don't separate them by a quarter mile. It'll all those images, they'll come back to the home unit. You can check one unit easily. Another thing a lot of hunters overlook is the fact that they don't monitor access sites and points to their hunting property. Set up at least one or two of your cameras at gates, trails, anywhere someone might come in. That way you'll know if there's any sneaky activity going on on your property or just simply a landowner moving cattle or something that may screw up that afternoon hunt. Knowing those little details can put you in the driver's seat for success this fall.